This video is sponsored by Babbel, the number one language learning app in the world with more than 10 million subscriptions worldwide. Sign up today to get 50% off a six-month subscription. Jupiter's moon Europa is the smallest of its four large moons, but beneath its icy crust lies an ocean with perhaps twice the water of all of Earth's oceans combined. Most of what we know about Europa comes from the Galileo mission to Jupiter in the 1990s, but two new missions are being developed to further investigate what may be the most promising place in our solar system to find life beyond Earth. Welcome back to Launchpad. I'm Christian Reddy, your friendly neighborhood astronomer. And today we're talking about Jupiter's moon Europa because it is the most likely place in our solar system to find life outside of Earth. In fact, I think it's even more promising than Mars. Now, the story of how we came to know all of this about Europa begins more than 400 years ago in January 1610, when the Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei pointed his telescope toward Jupiter. He found that unlike the other planets, Jupiter was accompanied by a coterie of four satellites that changed their position from one night to the next. Galileo had discovered a solar system in miniature. Now, Galileo had a rival named Simon Marius, who in turn claimed to have discovered the moons about a month before in 1609. Marius later suggested naming the moons after the lovers of the god Zeus in Greek mythology, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. He even attributed the idea to Johannes Kepler. Galileo was a brilliant scientist, and like any Italian that I grew up with in my family, had a way of resenting his competitors and accused Marius of plagiarizing his observations. He rejected the whole naming idea and just referred to the moons by Roman numbers. Now, I've always been a fan of Galileo, and since I'm half Italian myself, I've always wanted to learn how to speak Italian, which is why I'm so happy to thank Babbel, who are very kindly sponsoring today's video. Babbel is the number one language learning app in the world with more than 10 million subscriptions worldwide. It's better than other apps because it allows you to practice with everyday conversational language that you can use in real life. Babbel's lessons are designed by a team of linguists and instructional designers and is presented in a friendly, game-like format. In fact, I don't even think of it as learning Italian so much as I like to think of it as playing Babbel. But uh, like I said, I'm a fan of Galileo Galilei. There's a reason why I'm wearing him on my middle finger, if you know the whole story. And now I can say things like, I per se muove. All right, actually, I, I could say that before I studied with Babel, but now I can say more. I can actually read some of his work. So really looking forward to uh, getting to know you there better, Galileo. <laughs> I'm talking to a puppet. If you want to level up your language game, I invite you to give Babel a try. And if you sign up at the link below, you'll get 50% off a six month subscription. Make sure you use the link in the description of this video. In the 1950s, telescopic observations suggested the presence of water ice on the surface of Europa. And these were near infrared spectra taken at low resolution, but those were the first hints that Europa was in fact a water world. But we didn't get a look at Europa's surface until December 3rd, 1973, when Pioneer 10 made the first ever flyby of Jupiter. It captured a single photo of Europa. It wasn't much to look at, but it showed how bright and reflective the moon is. Pioneer 11 followed a year later in 1974, but it wasn't until March 1979 when Voyager 1 gave us our first detailed look at Europa. It revealed a surface covered in intersecting lines called linea, which is Latin for line. Why did they just call it line? Four months later, Voyager 2 made an even closer flyby in July 1979. Now, this was the clearest evidence yet that Europa was a fractured world. Voyager 2 also showed that Europa's surface doesn't have any craters or any large mountains. These were signs that Europa was a geologically active moon. Otherwise, the craters would have accumulated all over the surface and any mountains that had formed would still be there. Since Europa was so smooth, it could only mean that its surface was being renewed by active geology. And this was when the idea of an underground ocean at Europa started to gain traction in the scientific community because active geology requires internal heat. 
Well, since Europa is made up of rock and water ice, then its hot interior should be able to melt a layer of that ice into an ocean, or at the very least, a slushy layer of warmer ice. Then, in December 1995, the Galileo spacecraft arrived at Jupiter. This was the first dedicated Jupiter orbiter, so rather than a single flyby, Galileo could make several flybys of Europa and image the Moon at much higher resolution. These observations gave us our best look yet at Europa's surface. Some of its smaller craters, like Puel and Mananen, appear flat, like they would if they formed in warmer ice. Meanwhile, the largest craters, Kalanish and Tira, have a bull's-eye-like appearance. This may be the result of an impactor penetrating through the ice and into the water. Ice could then flow into the center, forming the bull's-eye rings in the process. Galileo confirmed that Europa's surface is, overall, very smooth. And in fact, Europa appears to be the smoothest body that we know of in the entire solar system. However, its equator may be covered in blades of ice called penitentes. Here the sun rises to directly overhead. Low-density ice sublimates, leaving behind a terrain of spikes. A Galileo lacked the imaging resolution needed to really verify that the penitentes are actually there. But radar and thermal imaging suggest that they should be there and should be about 15 meters tall. The lineae crisscrossing the surface are likely caused by eruptions of warmer ice as the crust spreads open. You can even see how opposite sides could have fit together in the past. Freckle-like spots called lenticulae dot the surface. These are between 5 and 10 kilometers across, and may be due to warmer ice convecting upward, kind of like a giant lava lamp. All of this adds up to a geologically young surface that at most is 500 million years old, but most estimates put it somewhere between 180 and 20 million years old. Now, 20 million years is a long time for you and me, but remember, Europa likely formed with Jupiter four and a half billion years ago, so a surface just tens or even a hundred million years is brand spanking new in geologic years. All of this active geology requires a source of internal heat, but a moon as small as Europa should have radiated away its primordial heat by now, so how could it still be hot on the inside? Well, there's a couple of ways. First, Europa is a differentiated moon, so that means dense materials and heavy elements sank into the core. Some of those heavy elements are radioactive, so over time they decay and give off heat in the process. But a bigger factor is an effect called tidal flexing. Jupiter's tides have long since locked Europa's rotation so the same side of the Moon faces Jupiter at all times. But Europa is in an orbital resonance with Io and Ganymede. That means every orbit it feels a slight gravitational pull from Io, and every other orbit it feels a stronger gravitational pull from Io and Ganymede. These resonances keep Europa in an ever so slightly elliptical orbit. So Jupiter's tidal forces on Europa strengthen when the Moon is closest to the planet and relax when it's farther away. This continuous tidal flexing generates a lot of friction inside the Moon and heats up the interior. Enough, perhaps, to melt underground ice into an ocean. Meanwhile, Europa's surface is extremely cold. At five astronomical units from the Sun, Europa receives just 4% of the sunlight we get here on Earth. Temperatures at the equator are just 110 Kelvin, or minus 160 degrees centigrade. At the poles, temperatures plummet to just 50 Kelvin, or minus 220 degrees Celsius. At those temperatures, Europa's icy crust is as hard as granite. It's also radioactive. Europa is embedded deep within Jupiter's magnetosphere, which is the strongest in the solar system after the Sun's. It strips charged particles from the solar wind and accelerates them along Jupiter's magnetic field lines, which Europa passes through. As a result, the surface is hit with about 5400 millisieverts, or 540 rem, per day. And that's bad, because it is enough to kill someone after a day's exposure. So. The good news is that you wouldn't have to worry about slipping on Europa's ice, but 
The not so great news is that you'll probably be too busy getting a lethal dose of radiation to properly appreciate your strong footing. However, as you lay dying in the cold Europan night, you may notice that the moon is glowing. Europa's ice is a mixture of water and salts like magnesium sulfite or Epsom salt. In November 2020, scientists at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory showed that the radiation bombardment of the ice energizes the salt crystals, which in turn give off visible light in response. However, that radiation appears to be responsible for Europa's atmosphere. Yeah, Europa has an atmosphere. It was first noticed in 1995 by the Hubble Space Telescope. Its high-resolution spectrograph detected molecular oxygen and some water hovering around the moon. The atmosphere is very thin at just one trillionth of Earth's atmospheric pressure. But then Hubble discovered something else in 2012 when a team of astronomers detected a concentration of water vapor emission in Europa's southern hemisphere. Then another team used Hubble to image Europa from 2013 all the way through March 2016. Now, these observations were timed to capture Europa as it transited in front of Jupiter. That way, any atmospheric features around the Moon would show up in silhouette. During four of those transits, Hubble spotted what appeared to be the silhouettes of plumes coming from the same direction in Europa's southern hemisphere. Yet another team used the 10-meter Keck telescope to search for water vapor on Europa in the infrared part of the spectrum. The observations were carried out over 17 nights from 2016 through 2017. On one of those nights, Keck detected a spike in the water emission. They estimated that there was something like 2,095 plus or minus 658 tons of water being ejected. The location of the plumes correspond to a warm spot on the Moon's icy crust that were detected by the Galileo spacecraft at least to the extent that 95 Kelvin is considered warm, but certainly warmer than the surrounding surface. We've seen this before, at Saturn's moon Enceladus. There, the Cassini spacecraft discovered water erupting from Enceladus's southern polar region. This is a phenomenon called cryovolcanism, literally cold volcanoes. These Hubble observations suggest that Europa has cryovolcanoes of its own, or at the very least, cryo-geysers coming from its southern polar region. It's these plumes and the bombardment of radiation that appear to be creating Europa's atmosphere. As UV light from the sun and charged particles from Jupiter strike the surface, water molecules get liberated from the ice. Some of it gets broken down into free hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen escapes and a thin atmosphere of water, oxygen, and hydroxyl surrounds the moon. These molecules fall to the surface. Some of them bounce back off and return to the atmosphere, but the rest may work its way into the ice. As the ice moves, some of it gets subducted back into the underground ocean, bringing oxygen down with it. How much oxygen? Well, one study showed that even if the surface were a half billion years old, subduction could still bring Europa's O2 concentration up to the same level as they are in Earth's oceans. Even though Europa is smaller than our moon, its ocean is thought to be global. If so, it could hold up to twice as much water than all of Earth's oceans combined. Now, to be clear, we still don't know for certain that there's an ocean down there. It's possible the subsurface could be slushy ice instead of liquid. But another line of evidence that favors an ocean comes from Europa's magnetic field. The Galileo spacecraft noticed changes in the local magnetic field around Europa on different flybys. These changes were attributed to Europa passing through different parts of Jupiter's magnetic field and triggering responses in the local field around the Moon. It's kind of like the way car keys in your pocket will set off an airport metal detector. Now, sure, Europa does have an iron core, but it's too deep inside to produce the changes measured by Galileo. But those changes are possible if Europa has a layer of conducting material near the surface, say, a liquid water ocean. But Galileo also detected some additional variations in the magnetic field that an ocean could not account for. But after those water plumes were detected by Hubble and Keck, researchers went back to the old Galileo data 
and modeled how the magnetic field would also change in the presence of a water plume. Sure enough, the model matched the data beautifully. Although they didn't know it at the time, Galileo flew through one of Europa's plumes. So yeah, Galileo is most likely an ocean of liquid water with dissolved oxygen that's at least as deep as Earth's and certainly has a hot interior. And that's why there's so much interest in whether or not it can support life, even if it's just bacteria. It would be something like the habitats around the hydrothermal vents found along the bottom of Earth's oceans. Natural chimneys called black smokers vent superheated compounds of carbon-based nutrients that are escaping the mantle. Even though the temperatures can reach as high as 460 degrees Celsius, extremophile life thrives in these environments. If it has deep sea vents of its own, then there may be life in the ocean of Europa. It's an amazing prospect, but we need data. In a perfect world, we'd land a robot on the surface, drill through the ice, drop in a submersible, and see what swims by. But the ice is pretty thick. It would be a lot easier to go through two kilometers of ice than, say, 20 kilometers. But it would even be better if we only had to drill through, say, 100 meters. Well, it turns out that a new paper in the November 2020 issue of Geophysical Letters showed that plumes could also come from within the icy crust itself. A hotspot just underneath the surface could melt the ice into an underground lake and produce the occasional plume. If Europa has subsurface lakes, then that opens the door for possible habitats that would be much easier to investigate. In any event, though, we need to do a little more prospecting first. To that end, NASA's Europa Clipper will make a series of flybys starting sometime in the late 2020s or early 2030s. A dedicated orbiter would be a lot nicer than a bunch of flybys, but the radiation environment around Europa would kill an ordinary spacecraft. A dedicated orbiter would have to be radiation hardened in order to survive, but that would have doubled the mission cost and Congress wouldn't have funded it. So the Europa Clipper mission will instead orbit Jupiter and make about 45 flybys of Europa over its three and a half year mission. That will minimize the amount of time spent in the harsh radiation environment while maximizing the science. The spacecraft is currently in its final design and early fabrication phases. It's set to launch in 2024, but how long it will take to get to Jupiter is going to depend on whether they launch on a commercial rocket or if they can launch on the space launch system. But not only is the launch vehicle uncertain, but the whole COVID-19 thing slowed things down as well. Most of the on-site work at NASA facilities just came to a stop. So right now, the project team are trying to figure out what changes are going to be made in order to stay on budget and still make the 2024 launch date. Despite these restrictions, the spacecraft subsystems are still getting built and most of the science instruments are now under development. Among them are cameras and spectrometers to create high resolution images and map out the composition of Europa's surface and atmosphere. There's also an ice penetrating radar to search for subsurface water and a magnetometer and gravity instruments to measure Europa's magnetic field and work out the distribution and depth of its ocean. The spacecraft will also carry a thermal instrument to locate pockets of warmer ice and perhaps recent eruptions of water. It'll even have instruments to measure the composition of tiny particles. So Clipper will be able to fly through the plumes and analyze what's in the droplets. All of this adds up to a spacecraft that, while not designed to directly detect life, will allow us to assess Europa's habitability and determine where on the moon to search next. While NASA is going all in on Europa with Clipper, ESA's Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, or JUICE, will divide its time between Jupiter, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. JUICE is set to launch in 2022 and arrive at Jupiter in 2029 and explore the system for about three and a half years. It'll spend its first two and a half years exploring Jupiter and use gravity assists from Callisto to make targeted flybys of Europa. Now, while it's at Europa, the focus is going to be on the chemistry that's needed for life. 
That'll include searching for organic molecules and on understanding what that reddish non-water ice material on the surface is. JUICE will make the first subsurface sounding measurements of Europa and even determine the minimum thickness of its icy crust at certain locations. Then JUICE will use additional gravity assists from Callisto to change its orbital inclination and settle into an eight-month orbital tour of Ganymede. There, JUICE will provide the most detailed look of the solar system's largest moon and characterize its subsurface ocean as well. There's so much to be learned at Europa, and we have much to go before we can start to send landers and get into the ocean. But this sort of work will set the stage for a future landing mission that could sample the icy crust and even analyze to see if there's any bacteria in there. Now, if you're into recent news going on in the solar system, the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft just smashed and grabbed a big chunk of asteroid Bennu, and it's bringing it back home in a couple of years, so stay tuned for that. My thanks to my Patreon supporters for helping to keep Launchpad Astronomy going, and I'd like to welcome my newest patron, Cy KKM Knelson. That is a really cool name. I'd also like to thank Anna for her intergalactic level support, and Michael Dowling, Stephen J. Morgan, and Morrison Wild for their cosmological level support. If you'd like to support Launchpad for the price of a cup of coffee every month, well, please head on over to my Patreon page. And if you'd like to join me on this journey through this incredible universe of ours, well, please make sure you subscribe and ring that notification bell so that you don't miss out on any new videos. Until next time, stay home, stay healthy, and stay curious, my friends.